congregation we are going to sing from a hymn book cgs 502 cgs 502 saying count your blessings we want to sing verses 1 3 and 4 verses 1 3 and 4 
Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you for such a time like this, a time when we can gather together as saints from all over the world, Lord, to seek your face. We give you all the praise and all the glory, Lord. We thank you for these great meetings, Lord. You said if you be lifted up, you'll draw all men unto you, Lord. Tonight, Lord, we are looking unto you, Lord. Our eyes are upon you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we've enjoyed the sacred music, Lord. We're looking forward to precious testimonies, Lord. From the lips of the redeemed, Lord, we ask you bless those testimonies, Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, there'll be more music, Lord, more songs, Lord, from the choir, Lord. As we listen to this, Lord, we just want to hear you, Lord. When your servant comes, Lord, anoint him, Lord, with, um, with power from above, Lord. Lord, as you, are, you said, the anointing breaks the yoke, Lord. That you said, you, you said, when, you said when in the days of your power, your people shall be willing, Lord. Give us that willingness to seek you, Lord. And at the end, Lord, when we come to the altars of prayer, Lord, we just want your precious Holy Spirit to move in the hearts of men, Lord. That souls are saved, sanctified, baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire, diverse healings, Lord, and all sorts of them, um, you, know, you know, things that you will do from above, Lord. We just want to give you all the praise, all the glory, Lord. Everything else that will be said and done tonight, bless, Lord, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have in our midst, which of course, um, because of limited time we had in the morning, I couldn't go into that. We usually enjoy the support of our Portland headquarters every year. From time to time, we want to appreciate them for that, to support us from year to year. And for this year, they have done the same thing again by sending to us a whole family. The entire family, all the way from Portland, Oregon, our international headquarters, to be with us and um, support us for this camp meeting. We have Brother Clark Wolf, Sister Simin, and the children there at the back. You'd mind? They've been seeing you around. And Sister Simin, please, do you mind your kids to stand up? We're very happy to have them. They've been seeing you in front of you. If you are down, maybe just get up so that people can see you too. Thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate your presence. For them to travel all the way. They, some people may need to travel and still leave some people at home. But they came, the whole family. We want to appreciate them um, for that. We have had Brother Raju and Sister Savannah, the pastor of our church in India. They came here a few years ago. And it has pleased the Lord that this year again, that they should be here to support us and to be with us. Um, perhaps some of us who were not here that few years ago when they were here, you must have been seeing them around, but notwithstanding, but the right, your sister Savannah, can you stand up? All the way from India. Thank you so much for coming. God bless you. Thank you. Actually, we have many more from Canada, from Africa, from Europe. Maybe I just say all the first timers to UK camp meeting. You mind to stand up, please? First timers. Those that are coming to our camp meeting for the first time. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. Verse 1 of CGS number 18, during which the mic should have been with Sister Simon for our testimony, and then we take it from there. a youth retreat back in the U.S., and I had been trying to live a double life where you 
are a Christian, around your Christian friends, and you're not a Christian. But anyways, the Lord spoke to me at a youth retreat, and he said, if I came tonight, where would you go? And I knew that it didn't really matter at that point whether I was pretending to the whole world because the Lord knew I was in my heart, and I wanted to make sure that my heart was right, and I prayed, and I asked the Lord to forgive me, and he forgave me right then, and he sanctified me that same day and the same evening on a Sunday, he baptized me, and I'm very thankful that everything that I've needed to do in my life, I have prayed, and the Lord had provided. When it came time to get married, I wasn't looking for anyone to get married, but I said, the Lord, wherever you want, you know, it is yours, and he provided a great husband for me. He, ble- he blessed us with two children. I'm thankful that, again, I can travel and do the Lord's work, but I also enjoy doing it, and the Lord had made it easy for my children as well to come with us where we go. Um, Please pray for us. Thank you. There is no problem too big. God cannot solve it. There is no problem too big. God cannot solve it. No mountain so tall, he cannot move it. There is no storm so hell, God cannot carry it. There is no sorrow to see, God cannot see. evening that Christ is Lord. There is no problem God cannot solve. I thank God first that I was fortunate to be born in the gospel and even though being born in the gospel does not take sin out of your life, but I thank God that at one point the Lord met me, he saved my soul, sanctified and baptized me with the Holy Ghost and fire. Ever since then God has been all in all to me. I want to thank God for this camp meeting. I thank God for last year's camp meeting because I brought so many prayer requests to camp meeting. But I thank God that in his infinite mercy, 
it solved all those solutions. It solved all the problems. Um, one of them was uh, the traffic offense I had with the, um, with the police. And I was being threatened with um, about six points. And even while I was praying about that, that God, <laughs> why should this happen? I just received a second letter of a different offense with a, another uh, six points, making 12. And I was like, <laughs> from zero point to 12 points, how am I going to make it? That means I can't drive anymore. Uh, with my job, I have to drive. And I was praying to God, please, God, take me out of this. I brought this prayer request to camp meeting last year, and I prayed it every time. That was my prayer point, one of the prayer points. And uh, after a while, I went out, no, the camp meeting was over, and uh, one month, two months, three months, I didn't see the letter. And I was just thanking God, God, thank you. And about a month after, I just got a letter that I was to appear in court. And I was like, God, what is going on? I thought you have done this for me. And I started praying. I wrote prayer request. Do you know, after a while, like two days to the day I was to go for, uh, to the court, I got a letter that I shouldn't bother, that they've written all the case. And I was praying for the second one. Before I knew it, they wrote me a second letter that I shouldn't bother to come to the court. And that was how I was relieved from this burden. I thank God so much. I've brought another so many verses to this car meeting. And I know before the end of this car meeting, the Lord is going to surprise me. He's going to solve all my problems. I want to, uh, I brought this um, God to you tonight, that if you come with your burden, God will surely solve your problems. I give glory to God. Um, this doesn't really feel like I should give a testimony because I've been in church for, for close to two years now, but it is my first camp meeting. So um, I just wanted to thank God for how he's um, brought us here, uh, me and my family, and how he's kept us, how we miraculously, miraculously walked into church um, on the Christmas Day 2016. And ever since, God has been helping us and we've been growing in the word and been uh, meeting everybody as well. And just getting to know God deeper and love him more. Um, I just want to thank God. I pray that he will continue to keep us all, that we'll not just gather here on earth, but we'll gather there in heaven, and we'll think back to all these times that we spent here, and it will just be a glorious memory. Please, God. 
tonight, I'd like to read from the book of Genesis, chapter 2. Before we begin, I just want to say I bring greetings from Portland. I had countless people tell me to tell this brother or that sister hello from them. I didn't write all of their names down, so greetings from everybody you know. <laughs> my, my grandparents... Don and Pat Wolf and my dad, I remembered them. They wanted me to greet you, so greetings from them as well. We'll read from Genesis chapter 2, beginning with verse 7. It says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became, became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Skipping down to the 15th verse, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. We read here the tail end of the account of creation. We see and learn that man was created in the image of God. Uh, we know that God is eternal, we know that man is mortal, but we were made in God's image in the sense that we were made with a soul that will live forever. At the moment that God breathed into man the breath of life, not only did he become a living soul, but his spirit was made alive. Amen. There's a difference between a soul and a spirit. Our soul will live forever, one way or the other. But the Spirit is made alive when we become into a relationship with God. 
And that is the relationship that Adam was made to have. We soon soon, uh, learn that man was also given a free will. True praise and worship is the result of man having a free will. If God was to make us just like robots programmed to serve him no matter what, there would be no point of praise and worship. He would get no glory out of forcing us to do something. So we were given a free will, and because of that free will, we can exercise it to serve God and thus praise him and worship him in the way that he desires. We read later about the temptation of man. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast to the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. You know, when the enemy comes to tempt us, he often comes in a subtle way, like he did to Eve. And he often twists what we know to be true in a way that isn't correct. That's why he said, Hasn't God said you can eat of any tree? And she said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tr- fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath, God hath said, You should not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. We know that this temptation ended with sin. Ultimately, Eve took of that fruit, and she ate of it, and she shared it with her husband. And at that moment, they were separated from God. The, the, the spirit that had been made alive when God breathed into man, the breath of life, had died. That was the fall of mankind. Uh, because of that fall, sin infected the bloodline of man like a poison. So that all of man that would come from Adam forward would have that, what we call Adamic nature, which comes from the word Adam, Adam, that that, uh, propensity or desire to sin because of the fall of man, because of that sin. The effects of sin are very negative. Sin will prompt you to do things that you wouldn't otherwise want to do. It will prompt you to say things that you don't want to say. It will prompt you to go places that you don't want to go. Uh, But ultimately, the worst part about sin, the most negative effect that sin has, is it separates us from God. My first trip to India was almost 10 years ago. In fact, I was reflecting on that. We celebrated my oldest daughter, Sayla's birthday, just three days ago, she turned nine. And on our first trip to India, uh, Sayla, well, we found out Samin had been pregnant with Sayla. And so she came with us, but she wasn't born yet. And so leading up into that trip, I was very nervous. And I did what any expecting father would do. I started to wonder if it was safe. And I had researched a lot about India. And I, I knew that India was a place that had many snakes. Now, I've always been fascinated with most all animals, snakes included, and so I started studying about which snakes were in India, and I learned that they had something called an Indian cobra. Now, I've later learned that an Indian cobra is one of four snakes that they call the Big Four. It makes up the most deadly snakes in Asia, and the poison from the cobra can be lethal. I've learned a lot about cobras since then. I know that uh, today, approximately 20 to 30 percent of cobra, Indian cobra bites result in fatality. It's a serious thing. And when I was getting ready to go on that trip, I I wondered, could I get some anti-venom? And I researched that, and I found that, yes, it exists, but it's very expensive. It has to be injected in the right amount, and it has a short shelf life. And so it, it really wasn't worth it for me to do that. But I I, I had a respect for that snake because I know that it is deadly. Like I said, 20 to 30 percent of attacks result in death. It has uh, one of two types of venom found in snakes, which is a neurotoxin. It affects your respiratory system. So ultimately, if you die from a, a cobra, 
it's because you stop breathing. When an Indian cobra bites you, it's believed to give enough venom to kill approximately 20 men, or roughly one elephant. So that's a lot of venom. The cobra venom is deadly, but I know that it's not the most deadly snake in the world. Uh, in fact, uh, I know that there's the, the black mamba that has a venom that's more deadly. Those are found in, in uh, southern and uh, southeast Africa. And uh, while the effects of a cobra can present after just 30 minutes of being bitten, uh, after being bitten from a black mamba, people have died in as soon as 15 minutes. A very deadly venom. In fact, it's believed that before the availability of anti-venom for that black mamba, roughly 100% of those snake bites resulted in fatality. So those uh, venoms are very dangerous, uh, but sin, however, causes a much more severe reaction when we encounter it. It works much faster. In fact, the effects of sin are immediate. At the very moment when Adam and Eve sinned, when they disobeyed God, their spirit was instantly dead. The fatality rate is much higher. It causes death immediately. That is why God said, the day that you eat of that fruit, you will die. He didn't mean a physical death, like the fruit itself was poisonous, but the sin that resulted from disobeying God hit man like a poison, affecting immediately, causing that spiritual death. If you are not saved tonight, you don't want to make the mistake of thinking you're okay. Some people that are bitten by snakes, they don't realize it. And then when the symptoms present themselves, they think, well, maybe I'm, I'm a big guy, I'm strong, and I don't need to rush to get help right away. And they find those people later and realize they were bitten by a snake. If you're suffering from the effects of sin tonight, don't make the mistake of thinking, you know, I can handle this for a while. Maybe you plan on getting saved at a later time. Believe me when I say the enemy of your soul, of our soul, is not satisfied with somebody who is merely not saved. He wants to drag you down. It says in the Bible that he comes not but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He wants to take you down a path that will make it seem impossible to come back from, even though we know that that's not true. We know that Jesus is always very near, that he wants to hear and answer your prayer. Because of sin, mankind needed a remedy. Uh, we needed something like that anti-venom, something that could counteract that effect. Man in our own strength is not able to combat sin by ourself. We suffer the effect immediately. We needed a remedy. Uh, there was a, a plan that God had put in place to counteract this problem, the slaying of animals. And, and the Bible says that without remission, there can be no, uh, uh, without remission, there can be no satis satisfying of sin. I'm misquoting that. But we needed a redeemer, and that problem was a temporary fix, but it wasn't a permanent fix. It worked under the law, but man had to continually go back and seek uh, for redemption, uh, continually go back and, and, and seek for uh, cleansing, and it would work for a while. But God had a better plan. Uh, we thank God for Jesus, uh, the one that was chosen to be our Redeemer, the only sacrifice that was worthy enough. Uh, God's own Son manifest in the flesh, sent to suffer and die for you and for me. That was the only price that was worth our redemption that we could look to Jesus asking for salvation and we could not only be forgiven but cleansed uh, that we could not only be saved but kept through the power of Jesus blood there's power in the blood of Jesus we're thankful for the blood of Jesus our Redeemer sin has its consequences some are eradicated at salvation others uh, we may have to live with throughout the rest of our life. When I was in India that first time, I met a man whose job it was, he was called a snake charmer. And uh, he had this instrument he would play, and he had two baskets that had these snakes in it, and they would come out. And the interesting thing about that man is that 
one of his hands was uh, withered, withered up. It was hurt. And I had asked what happened, and when he was young, he had been bitten by a snake. And though his friends uh, were able to get him to the doctor in time to administer the anti-venom, for the rest of his life, he suffered from that wound. It had caused permanent damage. You know, one time I was in the state of Florida, where they have the Everglades, where the uh, alligators live. And uh, some of those alligators are larger than Volkswagens. And I, I went on one of those uh, boat rides where they take you out into the Everglades. And, and the driver, he was missing one finger on each of his hands. He was an alligator farmer. And I asked him, what happened to your hands? And his reply was, you know, you can't turn your head away from these animals for one moment. It doesn't matter if that snake charmer decided to go a different way and never see another snake again. It wouldn't have mattered if the man from Florida had moved to Portland where we don't have such things. They would suffer from those injuries the rest of our life. Likewise, sin can cause injuries to our life that we have to deal with. That is why we believe. That is why we preach. That is why we encourage to get saved while you're young. To get saved before you go out and make any kind of mistake that you might have to live with throughout the rest of your life. There's power in the blood. There's enough power to save a young person and to keep them the rest of their life. You don't have to go out into sin. Uh, you can live a life of victory. That's what God has planned for us. There's power in the blood. Temptation will come, but temptation doesn't have to lead to sin. Uh, when the enemy comes subtly like a serpent uh, we don't have to give in to that temptation the bible tells us that we can plead the blood oh, yes. that we can tell the enemy to get behind us we plead the blood of jesus knowing that there's victory in jesus god wants us to have victory in our lives there's victory available if we look to jesus we want to live our life without taking our eyes off of jesus we can't afford to take our eyes off of Jesus for a single moment. The question that I want to close with tonight is, are you ready? Are you ready? If you have not experienced the saving power that comes through Jesus' blood, there's no reason for you to go out today the same way that you came in. Are you ready? Uh, why not to make, make tonight that night where you can give the Lord your heart we know that he's here. Uh, we know that Jesus is waiting for you. We believe that he, if you're not saved tonight, he's already spoken to your heart. Why not make tonight that night? Uh, we have a message in Corinthians from Paul. It says, it's a message to the church. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Uh, that's a special invitation for the church. Uh, we're waiting for that day. We believe it to be soon, uh, where the trump of the Lord will sound. Those that are dead in Christ shall be raised, and those of us that are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet them in the air. And if you haven't made your reservation for heaven at that moment, it will be too late. We want everybody to make it. Are you ready tonight? If you're not ready, the Lord wants to hear from you. He wants to meet you at this place of prayer. Why not make tonight your night? Whatever your need is, God wants to hear and answer your prayer.
we thank you, Lord, because we know you are here. Oh, Lord, we are kneeling down in your front now, mighty Father. Oh, Lord, please come down. Amen. Save souls. Amen. Sanctify. Amen. Oh, Lord, please feel. Amen. With your spirit, please feel. Amen. Thank you, mighty Father. Amen. We shall go to our dormitories rejoicing today. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. That your blood that you shed on the cross of Calvary, you see to mighty Father to save soul. Amen. Watch hearts, mighty Father. Amen. Oh Lord, let's all go back rejoicing. Amen. Mighty Father, please heal the sin. Oh Lord, please heal the sin. Thank you, mighty Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.